Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this town hall that's entitled Overdoses in Nevada County. Uh, not necessarily a topic that anybody looks forward to, but uh, in 2019, Nevada County had zero fentanyl overdoses or, or fatal overdoses. Uh, as of today, we are up to 11 uh, fatal overdoses in Nevada County for 2020. And I would like for everybody to understand that we're going to talk about this topic. It is sensitive. And so maybe if you're uh, watching this with smaller children, just maybe be aware that we're going to, going to talk about really difficult stuff. So it's up to you to use your judgment. And uh, the goal of this is to create a dialogue with the community because there has been a lot of uh, talk, chatter, rumors, and misinformation also in, in the community about what is happening and what, uh, what is done or not being done. So if we could, uh, could we maybe, maybe Dr. Johnson, could you maybe uh, Kick, uh, kick us off and then followed by Dr. Evans and talk about the situation here in Nevada County. What is happening? Where are we at? Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Rick Johnson. I'm the interim health officer in Nevada County and I thank you for the opportunity to being able to chat with you tonight. Um, a few weeks ago, the Nevada County Sheriff's Office posted on social media that they'd received numerous reports of opioid overdoses. And they pointed out that several of them were linked to fentanyl. They had said that in their investigation, they learned that many of the fentanyl overdoses were the result of people ingesting counterfeit prescription drugs that were laced with fentanyl. Now I'm not gonna read the post, John is on the call, so he can he quote the post if he decides to do so. But basically this posting and other concerns that were raised directly to public health by community members prompted us to review what we have available to us in the health department, and that is death certificate data to determine how many accidental drug-related overdose deaths there were so far this year, and to see how many of those were due to fentanyl. And then we turned around and looked at the year 2019 for comparison, and here's what we found out. In 2019, in the 12 months, there were 18 accidental drug-related overdose, overdose deaths in Nevada County residents, zero of which were attributed to fentanyl in 2019. In 2020, by comparison, so far, there have been 24, not 18, but now 24 in this partial year, accidental drug-related overdose deaths with 11 of those due to fentanyl. And you might say, well, these are probably all in young people, right? No, they're as young as 18, some in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. So all ages essentially represented. Three of them were in the Eastern County and the others were in the Western County. We also looked at data from the EMS system through our local emergency uh, medical services agency and found that the use of naloxone, uh, which is the antidote to fentanyl and opioids, dramatically increased in this last year. There was a spike in overdoses resulting in a spike in the use of naloxone, both by bystanders, by law enforcement, and by EMS personnel. So that is significant and that correlates with the history of deaths. So all of this data put together seems to verify what the Sheriff's Office had warned the community of. So the health department recognized that this needed a community-wide response. And so we reached out to Behavioral Health to coordinate a meeting of key community partners to share the data and discuss how we individually and collectively could work together to address this community crisis. I mean, right now the crisis we always are talking about is COVID, but in the midst of the COVID crisis, here we have a crisis with opioid deaths related to fentanyl. So from a public health perspective, our response role is this. One is to ensure that there's accurate data 
so that we can truly understand what's going on in our community and keep monitoring that. And we will continue to do that. The second thing is we want to make sure that there are multiple avenues for the public and the professional community to have available naloxone or Narcan so that we can go ahead and try to prevent these deaths. And that should be in the hands of not only the professionals, but also family and friends of those who use opioids and community members who might come in contact with people at risk for overdosage. Public health is involved in community outreach and community education about factors that increase the risk in our community, such as this one, which is talking about fentanyl in the local drug supply and talk about approaches to reduce that risk. And then we need to partner with public safety on data sharing, on surveillance, targeting the interventions that are required and naloxone support. So since 2017, public health has been distributing naloxone and has assisted numerous other agencies and organizations such as behavioral health, local law enforcement, first responders, public defender, hospitality house, North San Juan Community Center and others in navigating the path necessary to either access Narcan or to become distributors of Narcan to members of the public, including the very brief education that's required uh, to go ahead and administer naloxone. We've released a PSA on October 16th. We've created web pages on fentanyl and naloxone access, and we will continue to update our data uh, and share that with everyone else so that we all can have a shared picture an understanding of what this continued risk is to our community. So thanks for the opportunity, appreciate it. Thank you. And Dr. Evans and then uh, Elenia Stevens, could we hear from you as well after Brian has gives us his perspective? Thank you, Pascal, and thank you, Eubinette. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about this very important issue and, and for you to put this on. I think it's really, really uh, a good idea to be talking about this. As Dr. Johnson said, you know, we've been in COVID mode for the last, you know, 10 months, basically. And um, I think it's been easy for everybody to just get hyper focused on the one issue of COVID and to not focus on some of these other very important public health issues. So um, I really, I really appreciate that we're doing this as a community. I think that the Department of Public Health and the other partners that we have in Nevada County have really done a phenomenal job of addressing what's going on in our community. I just have a couple of comments. So, so first of all, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Brian Evans. Uh, I'm the CEO at Sierra Nevada Memorial Hospital. My background is in emergency medicine. So I'm an, I'm an ER doctor and the bulk of my career has been spent clinically taking care of patients in the emergency department, mostly at Sierra Nevada. And so I know very well what it's like taking care of patients who have overdosed on opiates. Uh, you know, certainly we're able to rescue some of them and other people unfortunately don't make it. And this is a very serious issue and it's not new. This issue with fentanyl is, is relatively new. And I think we need to really talk about that issue and focus on this that issue. But I also wanna just point out that even if we can sort of get our arms around the fentanyl piece of this and the counterfeit drug issue and fentanyl, the opiate issue as a whole is still extraordinarily significant. And we have to, uh, as a community, really deal with it. And it's a nationwide is issue. It's an international issue, actually. Um, and there's so many things that have contributed to it that are really unfortunate. One is the overprescribing of narcotic uh, medication by physicians. Uh, another is big pharmaceutical companies really pushing uh, opiates out to the public. Uh, and then I think another thing we have to be very honest about is the stigma that has been associated with patients who have had substance use disorders uh, in our community and everywhere really. And I, I would say I'm at least happy to say that when I trained back in the mid and late 90s, um, you know, we're farther along now with regards to how we deal with people who are struggling with opiate addictions. Back in the 90s, it was really uh, a lot more blaming of patients and, you know, for their own addiction issues. And I, and I feel like, especially on this panel of experts, 
uh, there is a tremendous understanding that it is a disease process that we need to work with and solve together as a community. And stigma has no place in the treatment of this disorder. So I just wanna get that out there. Um, I think that COVID has been an extraordinary event in our lives and it has exacerbated this problem. It's not just the fentanyl that's in these counterfeit pills. It's also the fact that people are under enormous stress, uh, financial stress, social stress, their uh, support systems have been distanced from them. Uh, they're uncertain about our future. And because of that, I believe uh, it has led some folks to um, addictions that maybe they, they wouldn't have struggled with as much. So uh, it's good that we're getting together to talk about how to solve this problem. Again, I think the public health department has done a fantastic job. Dr. Johnson's done a great job and I, and I uh, wanna be part of that solution as the CEO of the hospital. I think the hospital has a big role in this as well. So I'll just leave it there for now and I'll answer questions as we go. Thank you. And Delinia, welcome. Thank you. Um, so I'm Alinia Stevens, and I'm the medical director at Chapaday Indian Health Clinic. Um, so we have a, a clinic in Grass Valley. Um, I'm also a family medicine doctor and um, an ad addiction board certified physician as well. And so I do um, some, some treatment and MAT groups at Grass Valley. Um, and I want to kind of echo some of the things that I've been seeing this year um, compared to the past. I think nationally, um, when I was at the, the recent addiction conference, they said 20% increase this year in overdose um, nationally. Um, and I'm seeing a lot more instability in my patients who suffer from addiction this year. Um, there's longer wait times to get into residential when they are unstable, um, just because of you know um, the nature of this pandemic and making sure that we're socially distancing and things like that. Um, there's more stresses in their lives. Um, um, we're seeing more patients who are pregnant um, who are using um, using drugs as well um, at a higher rate than was last year. And then just more mental health uh, co-occurring disorders that are happening too. So I think um, it's, it's complex um, and um, um, we'll probably need like a multi-prong approach to really treat this. Um, I think this is a symptom of a, a greater problem. Um, um, but I do think that the first step is public awareness. Um, some of our patients are, get, are seeing fentanyl in their methamphetamine supply, um, uh, in, their, in their marijuana supply, um, and in Percocet, which is um, what, what um, Dr. Johnson was talking about. Um, so uh, having fentanyl strips available for, for, for the public, um, we do a lot of testing for fentanyl in our patients to kind of just give them awareness of what they're using as well. Um, so I'm happy to be here, um, and I think um, we're we're excited to hear the conversation and and kind of brainstorm some solutions around that. Thank you, and of course, <clears throat> a lot of times the uh, uh, users, or especially when it, when there's an overdose, so somebody will call nine one one. Dispatch will of course send medics and more often than not also law enforcement. So maybe that's a, that's a good segue to uh, switch to the, the law enforcement partners that we have here tonight. We have Steve Johnson from Grass Valley PD and uh, John from uh, Nevada County Sheriff's Office. And maybe can you kick us off, John, and uh, tell us a little bit about what, what the experience of, for Nevada County uh, Sheriff's Office is and what is your involvement when, when a call like this comes in? Uh, yeah. Uh, good evening. I've been with the sheriff's office for well, since 2007, and a large part of my job detail has been in narcotics and narcotic enforcement. Um, and this year, more than any that I can remember, um, fentanyl in particular is a, a huge scare for us. Um, Narcan's being distributed. I think GVPD, as Captain Johnson, calculator, has carried Narcan for, I think, a few years. Um, but it's use in general from uh, EMS, uh, fire, all these, or bystanders has gone through the roof. Um, we're seeing people switch from maybe heroin or another opiate to something that's more available, um, which it's supply and demand right now. Uh, we could speak to the 
COVID-19 playing a role in that down the line. But long story short is uh, we shut down our borders and it's harder for a lot of the cartel, drug cartels to get their illicit narcotics across the street. Uh, therefore they um, search for other answers to keep making revenue. And where counterfeit pills have been a problem for quite a while, it's just more uh, prevalent right now. Um, and the ease for the cartels to uh, get their hands on fentanyl. Um, it's coming from our, through our research, coming from China to Mexican cartels. That's where they're producing these pills and then sending them up our way. So uh, we're seeing huge increase. Um, that's a lot of our caseload right now with our special investigations unit is trying to identify the suppliers and uh, even the users when we come across them to get their story more now than ever, why they're using, how much they're using, why they've switched from let's say a heroin to a, uh, a synthetic opiate. Um, so we're, we're deep in it, but still scratching the surface. If I unmute myself, it's easier. And uh, Steve, what about what about uh, GVPD? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think it might be a little interesting. I've been with uh, the Grass Valley Police Department since 1995. <clears throat> and just by way of, um, for the community, a little bit of history. Um, during that time, I remember in the, the mid to late 90s, um, heroin was around, but... Um, it was declining. And, um, you know, by the early 2000s, it was all but gone. Uh, we didn't see it in Nevada County anymore. And it had been replaced by other drugs like methamphetamine. And um, it was really kind of off, off the scene there for, for almost, I don't know, for, for many years. And, and John can echo this. And then I think with the you know, the uh, proliferation of the synthetic opiates that began to come out, I mean, the oxycodones, the oxycotons, and that kind of stuff that, as Dr. Evans uh, mentioned, you know, and initially were being prescribed and, and handed out in abundance. And uh, people were getting um, hooked on, on those synthetics. And when the prescriptions either uh, ran out or, um, you know, they couldn't get them anymore, um, they weren't available. What we saw is people started turning once again to, you know, the, the street version of the synthetics, and that was the heroin. And so we saw heroin come back. And, you know, it's been back in our community for, for many years now. But it, it was kind of interesting um, in law enforcement to kind of watch it, you know, disappear off the map and then come back. And just tragic as we see it just affect people's lives. Um, and then, of course, in recent times, what we've seen is that uh, the introduction of fentanyl and um, whether it's um, to as a substitute for heroin or, or uh, you know, a legitimate opiate or um, it's something that's laced in there. And it's not just with the heroin anymore, but we're seeing it, you know, um, introduced into methamphetamine and marijuana and other things. And um, sometimes with tragic results. And I guess as, as we began uh, issuing our officers naloxone back in at the very end of 2016. Um, so we've really had, you know, about four years now that our officers have been carrying that. We've seen that um, about three to four times a year, our officers have used it to bring someone back, you know, from an unconscious, unresponsive state. Um, which we would typically um, consider, you know, an overdose on, on an opiate. And um, the interesting thing about um, what we've seen is that, and John can attest to this too, I think, is fentanyl um, oftentimes arrives in um, batches, if, if you would, or, um, you know, we'll get a batch of it in the community. And so we'll see that, um, the need for naloxone and these type of overdoses will come in waves. And um, while that bad batch or that laced batch of either um, counterfeit pills or um, other drugs that are laced with fentanyl kind of works its way through. And so, you know, like I said, over the past four years, we've um, 
use naloxone approximately three to four times a year. And one of the concerning things is that this year we actually started out pretty well. This is just Grass Valley PD. But the first time we had to use naloxone for an overdose situation out in the field was August 6th. But in the month of August, we had four um, incidents where we had to bring someone back from the brink of death with naloxone. And, and so we saw that, that it, it kind of all converges on this bad run of fentanyl laced drugs that hit the community. And, um, and we get this wave of, of use of naloxone. And it's a wonderful tool. And you know the officers will tell you just the fact that they have something that they can use in the field um, and, and feel like they can actually, you know, have something that will help and bring someone back until medical help arrives is a wonderful thing to have. But um, August was a bad month for us. And, you know, you, you look at what's going on in the community and uh, COVID and all the social unrest and then the fires and, and all the stress that everyone has talked about already that's been put on society and people are isolated, they feel lonely. Um, they're desperate, whether it's financially or um, with their kids, with family situations, and they're fearful, they're frustrated for a variety of reasons. And, and so, you know, it just, it stands to reason that that's caused a lot of people to uh, search for coping mechanisms. And um, unfortunately, you know, when, when substances um, are, are what they turn to, oftentimes, you know, um, it's, it's disastrous if they run into a batch of something that has been laced with fentanyl. This is Dr. Johnson again, just to reinforce what Steve just said uh, on the Sarah, Sarah Sacramento Valley EMS reports, which is countywide, not just Grass Valley. Uh, in May, they reported six uses of naloxone. In June, nine, in July, four, but in August, it went up to 15. 15 in the month of August alone, and that's obviously countywide, but that was the peak. Uh, and after that, it dropped down to very low levels again. So like you say, it does come in batches. It does come in spurts. Uh, and August, as, as Steve said, seems to be the peak according to the EMS reports. Do we have data for September already? The EMS data for September that I have um, shows... Um, Four, four usages in September. And uh, Ariel, can you, can you talk a little bit from, from your perspective, uh, people that are reaching out that want help uh, that come to you or uh, an, another facility and uh, maybe for, for those who don't know who you are, just introduce yourself and, and uh, granite vet wellness that most most of us is still call core. Yeah, so thanks, Pascal. My name is Ariel Lovett, and I'm CEO with Granite Wellness Centers, formerly Community Recovery Resources, known as CORE. We go back actually in Nevada County since the 70s with various names, but um, we now are the primary nonprofit provider of substance use disorder treatment for Nevada and Placer County. So we actually, our services um, like the, the region span from Roseville up to the Tahoe Truckee region. And, and similar to what all the other panelists have been saying, we also began, I actually had a you know, call Phoebe that morning that Phoebe had emailed me um, saying, hey, we're really concerned about this. Although like Dr. Evans said, we've been in an opiate epidemic for some time. And we, along with other partners like Chapa Day, the hospital, Western Sierra, who's not on this call, but a lot of local providers ramping up our medication assisted treatment, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but we're already in this response to the opiate epidemic, then layering the COVID epidemic, but then starting to, to recognize this really alarming spike in fentanyl um, use and, and overdose. And, you know, so I think that I want to keep it fairly focused. And I think our other panelists have said a lot of the things that need to be said. I actually had listening sessions with all of the residents in our that are currently in our residential treatment program to really learn and really be able to target 
the outreach that we're providing. So I think there, there are three messages that I really want to communicate. And one is that fentanyl is dangerous. And that seems obvious. We all here, we know that many people that are using it don't know how dangerous and especially we're very concerned about our young people. Fentanyl being 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Um, and so getting that message out there very broadly and clearly in the community. The second one is that it is showing up everywhere, anywhere. Um, we, you know, we, the sheriff's department did a great job with the outreach about the pressed pills, the Percocet that are laced with fentanyl, but also in cocaine and in heroin and in MDMA, um, as well as being used on its own. But so, and, and, you know, this was true with folks currently engaged in treatment, not knowing that it was in fact present in these other substances that they're maybe using intentionally and knowing how to manage their use, but not knowing the presence of this, of this deadly synthetic. So, so the messaging being it's dangerous and it is place, you know, more places than people know. Um, and that's where it's really helpful for, you know, with our law enforcement really working on that, the the supply chain, where is this coming from? Because it is coming into our communities and people, you know, using substances and, and not knowing that it's present. And then the third one is really probably Pascal's main question uh, answering is that, that help and resources are available and we still are really working to get that message out there. And those are multiple and really getting the message out there that you know, we and we being not just Granite Wellness Centers, but you know, all these partners on this call, behavioral health, public health, Chapaday, Western Sierra, the hospital, I think really are committed to meeting people where they are. And that might mean starting with the distribution of Narcan kits. And I'd love to do some screen share in a second of some upcoming resources that we have. But Nevada County's done a great job um, creating a, a Narcan or Naloxone, Narcan being the brand name for a Naloxone uh, distribution effort. We have a, an outreach coming up this uh, at the end of this month where we'll be giving away free kits with the brief training and education um, that you know treatment is available, both outpatient treatment, residential treatment. There were, as, as um, I think Dr. Stevens alluded to, we have had due to COVID and due to demand, sometimes there are waits and sometimes there aren't. Um, letting people know that medication assisted treatment, I think there's still not quite full awareness that medication assisted treatment is widely available in our community and, and very effective. And that's been a push, you know, federal, state, local, public health, governmental agencies have been pushing as well as we have. And the hospital has been an awesome partner in stepping up in their bridge program. I don't know if Shelly's going to talk a little bit about that. But we really want people to know that these, these services and resources and supports are available in a non-judgmental way. We also have, and um, Phoebe might speak to this, but also, you know, with, with the distribution of naloxone, also promoting access to fentanyl test strips. So for people that are using illicit substances can test for the presence of fentanyl and be able to prevent the, the deadly overdoses that way. So, so those are the three real messages is, um, and even you know, in, these, in these listening sessions, people saying, hey, I didn't know until I heard from a friend that I could get into treatment. I didn't know that behavioral health would help me I thought I had to do something bad to get into Granite Wellness, you know. So really, all of us taking um, taking responsibility in every opportunity we have. So I don't know if I can share screen right now, Pascal, or if we're waiting for that, please. or yeah, okay, please go ahead. Um, and hopefully that will work. So this is. Um, we've been distributing this flyer as part of the awareness. This is obviously in Spanish. So also wanting to reach out to our Spanish speaking communities um, throughout Nevada and Placer counties. We um, have one with behavioral health's correct line on it. So I'll send that in a minute, but Nevada County's crisis line, um, our medication assisted treatment program. And we, you know, we'll support people to access other programs too, that we refer to Chapa Day, to Western Sierra, to Stallant, to, you know, various other providers that can um, be the best supports. I wanted to highlight this upcoming event as well. Um, and I will, when it's not my turn, I'll drop some links in the chat for folks as well. But our recovery and wellness series coming up on October 29th, this will be a Zoom training 
where we'll be able to provide free naloxone or Narcan kits to all attendees. So it'll be an orientation to what is medication assisted treatment, how to use naloxone in reversing overdose, and um, also just information about opiate use disorder. So that will be on Zoom at this link. And then people can drive through and pick up the kit at any of our sites throughout Grass Valley, Lincoln, Auburn, Roseville, Kings Beach, and Truckee. Um, and then also sharing you know, basic information like this out into the community. I think that um, Steve, a couple people, and Dr. Evans both mentioned the imperative to address stigma as a barrier to treatment, um, making sure that people feel comfortable. And I think that's what, you know, anyone on this call can do, you know, that, that all of us need to do on a daily basis is be that person that someone can talk to and have some resources to go to. One other that people could jot down is choosemat.org. Um, and that is California's site that will allow people to put in their zip codes to, you know, anywhere and link to medication assisted treatment and related resources. So, um, so those are some examples of some of the, some of the resources that we're sharing to, to get this information out into the communities. Perfect. Thank you, Ariel. And Shelly, you are also with Sierra Nevada Memorial, and I believe you have some, also some interesting experiences to share with you. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Shelly Leal, and I am the substance use navigator at Sierra Nevada Hospital. Um, we've had the bridge program for about a year and a half now, and um, it, it's really interesting to watch it grow because when it started, um, you know, people were pretty hesitant to come in and seek out treatment because of the stigma. You know, people are embarrassed and um, it's hard to come in and say, I need help. And over the year and a half, watching people, I mean, our program has really taken off and more and more people are coming in. They know they can walk in the doors of our emergency room and say, I'm here for Suboxone. And our staff is, is wonderful. Um, they've been received very well. Um, and so what happens when they come in, um, someone will call me and I'll meet them right there at the bedside. And if it's appropriate, if the doctor um, finds it appropriate, they will induct them right there with Suboxone. And we have about, I think, 10 providers now with X waivers, which is spe special licensing that the doctor needs to prescribe Suboxone prescriptions. So we always have a doctor on staff that can send that patient with a prescription. Um, and then I can link that patient up to a clinic, whether it's Granite Wellness, Western Sierra. Um, so it's a pretty smooth process and it's a great community effort, all of us working together. Um, it's been very successful. I'm very proud of what we're doing at the hospital. And can you give us a, a, an estimate of about how, how many people do you see in a, in a month? And, have you, and obviously you also have seen this increase in, in patients. So, but mm -hmm. are, we are we talking two, three people? Are we talking 10 people in a month? Well, it, it varies. Sometimes it can be, I think my, my lowest month was like four people. Um, but in the summer, my highest was 18. And so that's a lot for, for one month. So it does um, vary, um, but I think it, our, our program is getting out in the community a little more so people know we're available, that they can come there and get assistance. Great, thank you. Um, we also have Granat Roche and Jill Blake, both with uh, Nevada County Public Health. And so if, uh, would you like to add anything to the introductions or should we get to the questions? Jill, Glenna? Um, I'm fine with getting to the questions. I think Dr. Johnson uh, pretty much said everything <laughs> that I would have said. Okay. I agree, questions are good, but may I ask one question real quick because I, I did get dropped for just a moment. I'm not sure Dr. Johnson, if you had a chance to talk about um, the fact that Placer County and, and is it Sacramento County? are also seeing increases. You did not, go ahead. Um, I think that was it, just that you had shared when, when, you, when you came together with regional health officers 
and asked if other neighboring counties were seeing the kinds of increases in fentanyl overdoses that led to accidental deaths. I believe it was Placer and, and Sacramento County. Is that correct, Dr. Roche and Johnson? At they, least they Sacramento, I don't, I don't recall Placer, but at least Sacramento is reporting a similar experience to what's happening in Nevada County. And that's, that's not surprising, and it probably depends upon what the distribution channels are for the different drugs, where they're coming from and where they're going and who the suppliers are. Um, so um, Sacramento did, and I don't have any data, it was just an anecdotal report, but it was from their um, health officers also in Sacramento County. Yeah. So uh, I, I received several questions from, from people who, who had a very different approach to um, this, this problem because they wrote that they were either uh, the, the spouses or the caregivers for people who had uh, opiate prescriptions and then the opiate prescriptions were uh, cut in half or in some, some cases just uh, not renewed. But the patients were still in incredible pain and some said that basically out of desperation, wanting to help their, their, the, the patient people would go out and like one of them put it, I had to learn how to score opiates. So I, this question goes to, to our um, healthcare providers. Is it, in your opinion, is it better to have people uh, go off opiates of course after a while or or is this is it this due to the system that you you have to say at some point well you know what you you, ca you can't have the uh you can't have whatever pain medicine you have you, you have to get off that now are those purely medical or are they systemic issues and what so a patient or a caregiver in in, in that case what tools would you uh, give them? Because they are they're very desperate for their patients or their spouses. And of course, they, and, and they are also, on the other hand, they're deadly afraid as well that they would get a quote unquote bad batch and do incredible harm. So who wants to take this one first? Well, I, I would just say that from an ER doctor's point of view, and I, you know, in the past, we did not have the same tools that we now have today. Thank, thank goodness there's been some advancements in the way that we can deal with the symptoms associated with uh, opiate withdrawal. I'm not an expert in, um, in treatment with Suboxone. I think that there's a lot more ex uh, expertise uh, over at Granite and uh, at Sierra Family and other places. But, um, you know, this is, the, this is the problem with opiates is that they're, they're extremely difficult to get off of without help. And that's why what we need to do is connect people to the help that we have. And part of that is the medication treatment that we have. And the other part of it is the psychological support that could be offered and so many other things. So um, I would just say, it, you know, people, people need to seek help and there is help and the symptoms can be managed. And so can all the other stress associated with um, with getting off of these, uh, these difficult, uh, substances. So, um, is it going to be a cakewalk? Probably not, but I think that it can be managed. Thank um, you. And Dr. Stevens. Yeah. As a family medicine physician, I have these conversations a lot with our, my patients. Um, um, we, we, you know, we taper people. Um, what I've noticed is, um, uh, sometimes switching them to buprenorphine for pain, even if it's more dependency instead of addiction, um, can be helpful. Um, but what I also notice is people who are on chronic opiates, um, kind of what Dr. Um, Evans was alluding to, they have this um, dysphoria and like depression and anxiety from this roller coaster of opiate withdrawal um, um, that kind of is very disruptive to their lives. And, um, and when they do get off of it, it does, it does get better and their mood is better and they're able to be more clear. Um, and so there's different tools that we have to do that. And um, there's like, there's help now at Chapaday, at Western Sierra. 
um, Granite Wellness, um, um, Family Sierra, like there's a lot of um, MAT programs that when I started uh, four years ago, it wasn't, wasn't in existence. So we have the tools um, um, and we understand a little bit more about the physiology of it. So um, um, I'm hoping that that helps, um, but there is still a stigma. And so I think compassionate uh, and understanding um, our role as physicians and maybe part of the problem um, that started in the 90s, you know, um, and being empathetic um, to that patient experience is important. And uh, I'd like to add something too. I think uh, at some point physicians started changing the way they treated chronic pain, uh, but there were a lot of people who were stable taking narcotics. And at this point, if someone has been cut off completely without any of the long-term tapering or the help that they should have, I would encourage that family member to find another physician that might be able to help them. Uh, Dr. Stevens has just mentioned that at Chapa Day they have a, a good treatment. And rather than going on the street and finding uh, illegal drugs for their loved ones, uh, change doctors. If the doctor that they're seeing is not meeting their needs, there are plenty of doctors that can. It doesn't mean that they'll get narcotics forever, but uh, there are other ways now of treating pain and uh, you can be tapered. It takes a long time, but you can be tapered from these drugs. I have to, I have to say I was I was really uh, I was really shocked by 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 the messages by the emails and and, and calls that that we got in, in ahead of, of this town hall the actually the number of people that that found themselves in that situation and that were really um, they are and some of them actually did what what, what you said uh, Dr. Troche and they went and, and tried to find other doctors but. Uh, oftentimes, with um, the insurance or the or uh, that type of insurance, it's, it's it was very difficult. But moving on from from that, uh, so we've all heard or seen the rumors that uh, it's that there is a lot of juveniles that are now um, all of a sudden um, addicted to these uh, opiates and. People are like, well, of course, it's COVID. Um, the isolation, the uh, the drastic changes in, in behavior that everybody had to, to apply and, and still does. So <clears throat> can we talk a little bit about how COVID can... On the other hand, wouldn't COVID and more isolation, wouldn't that make it easier for people to to stay away from maybe uh, uh, inducements or stay away from stay away from uh, a group of individuals that they normally would hang out with, and why is it why is COVID all of a sudden being uh, a factor in this increase in in fentanyl overdoses, or is it a factor? I don't know if I can fully answer your question, but I can start. A lot of our outreach really has been focused on young people. Again, even prior to this fentanyl spike, California was very concerned about young people. Well, even again, preceding this, we know that 90% of Americans with a substance use disorder begin their use as children and teens. And that is how the neurobiology of addiction progresses. And so from a public health approach, from a treatment provider approach, we want to, for multiple reasons, start outreach and prevention with our youth. Um, you know, I think that for our young people, I'm also the parent of a couple local teens <laughs> right now and in and going through this. And what we know is that what we are experiencing that Dr. Evans, I think, outlined really clearly the stress, the anxiety from multiple aspects, not just the isolation, but fear of the disease, fear of the unknown, economic pressure. Um, our young people are experiencing that just as much. They are also not 
isolating as much. And this is happening, you know, we, we know this, this is high school students and college students. Um, and again, I think there's a lot of factors there that in, in the developmental phase of the teenage brain that is also really susceptible to developing addictions as it's, as it's in that crucial developmental phase. It's also a time when, when we young humans need to connect with people. So I think it's a really challenging confluence of factors um, that is, that is um, exacerbating potentially this already really risky situation. Um, I think our, our, again, our outreach to young people needs to be like to all people, very honest and um, very resource rich. So they need to know that we're supporting them, that we'll listen to them and, and provide them honest, factual information. And I think that needs to be also the focus of our outreach and tied into what they care about, which is we find out what they care about. Um, but, but their whole health is part of that connecting with their peers is part of that. Um, and I think I just wanted to respond. And when it came to teens, another real concern is, is the presence of, fentanyl and Xanax and, um, you know, Xanax that's Xanax bars that are, that are, uh, accessed on the street illicitly and really concerned about that and our young people. And, uh, and it seems like our young, a lot of our young people are really heads up, but, um, but I think again, a lot don't know. So coming back to those same messages that they need to hear this. I mean, we can't protect them from, um, we can't protect them from the fact that this is happening. And so they need to know the risks that are present in, in their community and they likely already do. So Pesca also working as a school resource officer for a little while with the sheriff's office. And then also um, I've coached uh, for a dozen plus years uh, youth sports. Um, having kids at school is important. There's some families that we don't all see that the child, his one breakaway for the day is going to school, whether he says he likes to be there or not, that's his breakaway. Uh, for the longest time, back in the 90s, we talked about after school programs and what it does to save kids. Well, now we're keeping children at home, uh, idle hands or the devil's workshop, take that as you want it. But a firm believer of, we don't have any structure for these kids going forward and mom and dad are trying to make a living at home. Um, Next thing you see, Junior's reaching out to people he normally hasn't, and also the uh, avenues for kids to talk to each other nowadays uh, is all over. I can't even keep up with my 17-year-old son's uh, messaging. He, there's, you know, 100 different apps on how they can talk to one another. So it, it's very scary. Um, I think a lot of good parents are trying to make ends meet, and a lot of children are paying the price for being home, being forced to be home. I just want to one quick thing on that too. Two of our local pediatricians became ex wavered as well. So uh, meaning that they, with, with Sierra Care physicians, um, Dr. Mike Curtis being one of them. So, so making sure that our, our healthcare providers know that if there are young people with opiate use disorders, um, Alexa Curtis here at Granite Wellness Nurse Practitioner and then Dr. Mike Curtis as well can both be good resources for that. And I'll put a number in the chat as well. And then at Chapa Day, we have um, Dr. Keon and Sarah Bland um, and myself up there that see kids as well. Awesome. I think just to piggyback on some of what's being said, um, I think we still don't really know what the long-term impacts of this COVID chapter are on sort of the mental health and behavioral health needs of our community. We had a lot of theories going into this about what we would see and a lot of fears. And some of that is certainly playing out. I, I think we all know that everybody is struggling a little bit. There's a lot more depression and anxiety in certain ways. But on the flip side, I've also been really impressed by the resilience um, we are collectively showing our young people, our older people. Um, we haven't seen the skyrocketing rates of suicide that we were worried we would see or the um, skyrocketing rates of um, needs to come into our crisis systems. So how much of what's happening right now around um, overdoses has to do with COVID, I think is a little bit hard to say. And I think kind of it doesn't matter in certain ways also. It's an indicator of a need in our community. And I think all these different partners are putting a lot of different ways we're trying to address that need and meet that need. And I think like Ariel was saying earlier, meeting people really where they're at, wherever they are in their continuum of use, of desire for treatment, 
and starting dialogue, opening the door to say, hey, this is a tough one. And there are a lot of options here for you when you're ready to engage with them. And in the meantime, here's some ways you can keep yourself safe so that you have a chance tomorrow to think about getting into treatment if that's what you wanna do. And that's even more true with our young people, um, helping them see the options that lie before them um, so that they stay safe in whatever path they're on right at this moment in time. And I think I just wanna to touch for a sec on the fact that it's easy to begin to think about this um, situation that's going on in the abstract and their numbers that we're sharing and sort of data points that we're putting out there and phone numbers and access and, and all those pieces. But at the end of the, the day, these are people in our community that are being really painfully impacted by this. People's lives are being lost, people's lives are being changed. And every one of these data points has circles of suffering around them, people that loved them and cared for them, their friends, their family. And we need to use our own social networks to think about how do we get more word out there? And, and as Dr. Evans said, decrease that stigma and really open honest dialogue on this topic so that we can really together reach out for the help we all need when we need it. And, and speaking of reaching out for, for help, um, maybe we should touch on uh, the, the the Good Samaritan law. So basically, if you are if you are in independent of somebody, and, and if you are even if, even if you have even if you if you did drug drugs yourself, and you are calling nine one one because somebody has an overdose, please don't don't just run away. Call nine one one because. As I understand it, you will not be prosecuted for doing drugs uh, when you call 911 to, especially for an overdose. Could maybe, John, maybe can you weigh in there or Steve, one of you? I think that's a great idea. That that's, you're, ac you're correct, it's accurate. Um, maybe that's something that we need to push out as a community to let everybody know that's unaware. It's very common for us to have people that want to help but are afraid oftentimes to call law enforcement due to the fear of getting arrested themselves. So that might be another public service announcement that's worth pushing out. Steve, anything to add? Uh, no, but just that that is a very important message um, and that is absolutely correct. I mean, we, uh, you know, in the city, we have uh, cars that will drive up to the ER at times and roll someone out the door and speed off because they're afraid that, you know, they're, they're taking someone to get help, but they're afraid that they're going to, you know, be arrested for doing that. And there are amnesty laws, good Samaritan laws in place that protect individuals for that, you know, valuing the, the individual's life above all else. And, and so whether it's you're calling from a home and people, law enforcement, first responders are coming to where you are to render aid or whether you're taking them into a facility, um, that's not something that people need to worry about. Obviously the priority is saving someone's life. And, and, and maybe, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. Regarding naloxone, there might be some hesitation on some people's part to say, well, what if I don't really know if it's drug overdose? What if I make a mistake? There really is no downside to giving naloxone. If it turns out it's not a drug overdose, the patient or the person that you're giving the naloxone to will not respond. And so if the person doesn't respond, you can give the dose again after a couple of minutes. But if they don't respond, then think through what else you need to be doing in terms of CPR and certainly calling 911 and so on. But it's not like the patient is going to have a bad effect from giving naloxone where it wasn't necessary. There's no downside to it. Give it if there's any doubt. The thing is, it needs to be out there. It needs to be available. It needs to be given liberally when there's any doubt, when there's an unwitnessed uh, person down where you don't know what's going on, give them naloxone. And if they don't respond after a dose or two, then certainly think about what else it might be. Get help with 911, start doing CPR, things like that. Uh, but there's no downside to it. So it's gotta be out there. It's gotta be available. People need not to hesitate to use it. And with fentanyl, I think it's important to do mm -hmm. at least two doses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pascal, I'd like to add that um, Sierra Nevada just got a grant for naloxone. So we're giving it out for free. We'll start probably by the end of the month. 
So anyone is welcome to come. If you have kids, family members, if you know someone, um, please come to the hospital and we'll educate you on how to use it um, when we give it out. And it'll be available hopefully by the end of the month. More resources, the more resources, the better. Because uh, I, I really think that, I mean, <clears throat> when Phoebe contacted me about this town hall, she, she was talking about the testing strips and I'm like, testing strips? I had no idea. Uh, I had no idea that you actually could, that there were testing strips for fentanyl and that they were available and that you could just, that that's, that is an option. So uh, definitely I'm hoping that we, we can reach uh, a lot of people today and every day. And um, I think the, it probably would be a, a good idea to repeat the phone number that where people can actually just call or text. And uh, Phoebe, do you, do you have that, that number uh, handy? Yeah, I mean, the good news is as you're hopefully gathering from this conversation, mm -hmm. there's a lot of access points for resources. Mm -hmm. um, basically every partner on this call is a place people can go to get naloxone. Um, and many of these places also have um, fentanyl test strips. But um, texting might be a good option for people as well. And so yep. both public health and behavioral health have numbers that people can either call or text. Um, and I'll put them in the chat as well. But 530-388-6364 is a good number um, that people can reach out to. And I'll add some other numbers in the text. And there's a website where we've got a lot of this information as well. Mm -hmm. And virtually everybody on here. And I, th I do really want to stress that while many of us are access points for treatment, you don't have to be seeking treatment to reach out for either naloxone or test strips. It may be just that you wanna stay safe right now and that's okay. And we would love to dialogue with you, get you what you need, talk to you a little bit about how you can stay safe right now and, and open the door for you. So if you reach a point in time when you wanna pursue looking at treatment, that's there too. But it's the beginning of a relationship and um, reaching out yeah, re reach, reaching out and and, and also re reaching out uh, to to your friends, to to family, uh, to family if if that's an option. Just and uh, for everybody else, the, the same thing. Just just help share the the available resources and 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 try and and talk about. Yeah, well, you will not be. You, please call you, even if you have naloxone and if you give a first dose, still call nine one one. Uh, it's okay. It's safe. For, it's safe for you, and it's 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 the right thing to do anyway. But it's also safe that you you won't be you won't get in trouble. Uh, and <clears throat> with we, we have so many. Uh, there's so much going on. I mean, there is of course COVID, and there are of course fires, and uh, uh, likely um, over the weekend we'll probably uh, large portions of. Uh, the Sierra will lose power because it's uh, we have a, a wind event. So there is a, a lot of stress. And while this is about overdoses, uh, can we talk a little bit about how we can maybe lower our stress levels? And I think that's something that everybody could use anyway. Uh, how we can lower maybe our, our stress levels um, without the use of fentanyl. Happy to speak to that a little bit and obviously others jump in, but I, I think something we've tried to stress throughout all the challenges we've faced over this past year is just the basic self-care principles. Um, it's time to just reground ourselves in those pieces, do your best to um, eat healthy foods, get yourself outside when you can, get exercise if you can, try to get good amounts of sleep, um, and then really connecting with other human beings your friends, your family, your coworkers, whoever whoever that circle is for you, it's unbelievably helpful helpful to just open up a little bit to somebody and say, "I'm actually not having that good of a time right now. This is really hard for me." Just saying that builds a, a, a relief in yourself and a connection with somebody else because good chance they're if they're not feeling that way right now, they felt that way recently, and through that connecting, it can really take a lot of the 
angst out of this time for us. And so just trying to find ways to support people in, in those kind of basic strategies of caring for each other and, and themselves first and foremost. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Phoebe, and I appreciate the question. I think, you know, this has been this has been an extraordinary year uh, in a lot of ways, and it's not just people turning to fentanyl, it's people turning to all kinds of different things, and there's been a lot of gallows humor uh, among colleagues of mine about, you know, don't check my recycling bin for how many bottles of wine are in there lately, because it's really been uh, quite quite an interesting time. We We've been isolated in a way that we haven't been before, you know? I mean, I haven't seen my mom since, I don't know when, January, I think, and and other people that I'd really like to see. Um, and I think that, that that just takes an enormous toll on people. And I'm fortunate because at least I get to go to work, you know, five days a week and go see people there, but we're all wearing masks. It's very difficult to really connect to people in the ways that we used to before. Um, so I, I think that all of us are taking a hit. It's a psychological hit and we're all trying to figure it out. We have tried to be a lot more deliberate at the hospital in terms of, uh, connecting. And we've, we've had events, you know, where we, we have events on zoom, but we've, we've also had some in person with all the social distancing and masks and all that good stuff. Um, you know, in limited numbers, but we are really trying to deliberately find out how people are doing. And so, you know, when you pass somebody in the hallway, this question of, hey, how are you, is is taking on a whole new meaning now because truly people are, are stressed out. And so many of my colleagues are dealing with, um, you know, distance learning with their children. Maybe they've got a hybrid situation that's causing all kinds of stress. There's massive financial uh, pressure on families right now. So um, I don't know, like somebody was saying, I, I don't know what the long-term effect of all of this is, but I think it does make, um, make the issue of substance use disorders much more significant for us. And we've got to figure some of these things out. You know, the other thing I just want to throw out there as more of a question is, you know, we've got, we've got the panelists here, we've got the participants here, and, it, and these kinds of events are fantastic. And I hope a lot of people watch this on YouTube. Um, but you know, the people that we really need to reach right now, I'm not sure they're here. And I don't know, I don't know what they're doing right now, uh, whether they're watching the presidential debate or they're doing something else. But, um, you know, I think about communication quite a bit and whether we've communicated enough and to whom to the right people and how are we doing that? I think that the county's done a fantastic job in a lot of ways. I know CORE does a tremendous amount. I just don't know if, you know, we have actually done enough to really connect to the people that need to hear about these important messages and if we need to get more creative and what else can we do so i just be open to suggestions along those lines um and, and it's something i'm concerned about and and maybe it would be maybe we have to uh, could all reach out uh, be that to the schools or to distance learning uh, the, the new center that's opening at the fairgrounds uh very soon and actually have an before I, before some classes start, maybe have these, maybe have these phone numbers just as as flashcards, or as 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 entry or exit screens. That actually a, a resource list. You know, um, if if you need food, here here is a number. If you need if if you if you need to talk to to somebody, here is a number. And then and then the, the same numbers for both for for public health and behavioral health for the. Uh, as far as far as substance abuse goes, that that might be something you might we might reach more people. Uh, it's it's one it's it's one option. We we have uh, a couple questions here. Um, it's um, if you know someone is addicted to drugs, can you red flag them at pharmacies in Nevada County so the addicted person cannot get fentanyl and other medications like it? Could that help with this issue that we're having right now? And um, in the ERs, could you ask patients if they really need a strong pain medication? Why don't you tell them there, there are other ways to deal with pain? So California does have um, a cures or PDMH system. So anytime a prescriber prescribes any controlled substance, we're supposed to look at that. So any prescription that is filled anywhere in California should come on there. Um, the only exception to that is if they're going to a methadone clinic um, that doesn't come up on the thing. And I'm going to defer to Dr. Um, Evans for the ER question.
Sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't hear it. So it's so for for the 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 ER portion of the question was, um, if you have uh, people could come to the ER, do you uh, do you have to give them the the, the strongest uh, pain uh, pain medication, or can you uh, suggest alternatives to to deal with pain instead of prescribing medication? Yeah, good question. So we, I mean, we do that. I, I think that the uh, physicians, uh, first of all, the ER doctors that we have at Sierra Nevada are phenomenal, and we have a incredible supporting team there. Uh, and they're very committed to um, improving the situation that we're dealing with collectively. Uh, so they're always trying to sort out how can we get pain control? How can we get symptom relief in a way that is not going to contribute to an opiate ad addiction? Um, and it, it can be, it can be difficult. You know, again, I keep going back to when I went <laughs> a million years ago when I was in training, and it was really different back then. And, and I think we were much more uh, liberal with opiate medication. And it was really all about, let's get the pain absolutely eradicated and get it to zero if we can. And we were not as aware at that time of the significant, um, you know, effects of opiate overprescribing. I think that we're well aware of it now. And I think the physicians are, are uh, really taking a lot of care to, to not contribute to that problem. And there are, there are alternative medications that can be used many times that are more effective than opiate medications for pain relief for a variety of uh, painful conditions. Anyone wants to add anything to, uh, to that? Okay. Um, the, the, next, uh, the next question is, again, um, uh, why are uh, prescription uh, people with uh, uh, prescriptions, why are they uh, lumped in with uh, when there is an overdose that happens, a, 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 a quote-unquote real accidental overdose, why are those cases lumped in with recreational uh, drug use? And I think that goes a little bit to the, maybe to the, the stigma question, uh, stigma that, that some people feel is associated with uh, uh, prescription drugs. Maybe. <laughs> what I would say, and I'll certainly public health folks or others jump in on this, but it, they're all accidental overdoses. None of the people are planning to die that day, um, whether they took drugs because they're a prescriber, they took drugs for other reasons. Um, and it's still a tragic loss of life that we want to prevent. And that's why we're here today is to reach all those different people and get some life-saving strategies in their hands. That yeah. that we have in public health does break it down that we, that we got from the EMS world that prescription um, intentional overdose, there's a patient count for that, prescription unintentional overdose, and then there's illicit drug overdose. So we have counts broken down into those three categories from the EMS world. Of course, not all of that information is necessarily public. So that is why a lot of the, there is a lot of uh, talk about either, st either stigma or uh, then there is the, the question about why, are t uh, why is anybody taking fentanyl as a recreational drug? What, what, is, the, what, would, what is the, what is the use of it? Why, why, is, fe why is fentanyl? Is it because it's it's readily available? Is it because it's uh, cheap? Is it why? Why is it why is it fentanyl or or, or Percocet or or any of these, these these opiates? Can any one of you address that one? The answer to that question depends. I mean, there's a multitude of different answers depending on you know the patient or the person. Um, I um, some people you know, start off with um, opiates um, in the pill form, go to heroin, and then fentanyl is kind of the next step because, um, you know, their receptors um, get used to drugs and so um, th those opiates, and so they need a higher dose to kind of have euphoria or feel something. Um, and so people, those they may be people who seek it out. Some people it's in other supplies. Um, some people, it's they've been using opiates for a long time. Um, so there's a multitude of different reasons that I've seen in, in my patients. 
I'm sorry, Ariel, I think you were going to say something too. Only if you didn't, I was going to say I defer to Dr. Stevens, but I, the answer would have been essentially the same. And I think there's like the, the question underneath that, which is why are people using drugs? And I think that's obviously the much more complex piece that, you know, we all struggle with. I mean, I eat too much sugar <laughs> and I try not to. And, you know, and, and for some people, there's a whole host of reasons that end them up in the boat where um, they are using drugs, whether it started with a prescription that flipped on a chemical receptor in their brain that made them have a really hard time not using those chemicals anymore, or there's trauma that happened that is painful and um, needs medicating in some way, shape, or form, or all the different variables that lead to um, how we all have dependencies on different things in our lives. And trying to undo, again, some of the judgment around that, recognizing the, um, particularly with opiates, the research is incredibly clear how um, chemically changing it is of your brain and how critical, um, how difficult it is to, once you have that chemical piece in place to just stop using, it's not that simple. And thus there's so much focus on trying to get medication assisted treatments available to people and help make that process a manageable process. To just add on that, like without medication assisted treatment, eight to nine out of 10 people relapse. And so that just speaks to how, how strong that chemical dependence is. I have a, a personal story I, I'll share about my son. Um, he's 28 and he had an injury at 18. He was um, a snowboarder and he had surgery and he was prescribed Oxycontin. So 10 years later, um, it, it ended up with a heroin addiction. Um, so we had 10 really rough years of addiction. Um, he did come in to the hospital and he got on the Suboxone protocol. Um, and I'm happy to say for seven months, he has been sober. Um, and I got my, my boy back, which is really awesome. And he, he, feels, he feels so good about himself. Um, but had anyone ever told me my son would have been an addict, I, you know, it's, it's hard to, it can happen to anyone at any time. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live, what you have, anybody um, is susceptible to this. Well, Shelly, I just, I just want to say, sorry to interrupt you. I just want to say that your um, willingness to talk about that, it's very inspiring. And, and what you do for patients every day at the hospital is incredible. But um, mm -hmm. to, to share that personal story, it, it takes a lot of courage. And I think that's part of what we need to do as a community is just talk about these, these occurrences and just take all the stigma right out of it because this is, you know, this is a situation, this is a problem that we need to deal with. It's a disease situation. Um, certainly physicians bear some responsibility, I think, for where we are today with opiates. Uh, and, and so I just commend you for what you do uh, at your you. job and, and what you've done for your family. Oh, thank you. You know, one of the things I tell people when they come in, when I first meet them, is I tell them I'm proud of them. And I've been with men that are just so tough and, and you tell them that you're proud of them for making that decision to make a change. And because they don't hear that often and we need to build them up and not make them feel ashamed. Um, nobody wants to be in that position and we need to be there and do whatever we can do um, to help change that for them. Absolutely. And, th and thank you for sharing. We have a few people who say, who want to thank you for sharing, for sharing your story publicly and absolutely. And, uh, you know, kudos to, to you, kudos to your son and uh, kudos to the, the system that actually, that it actually works. Mm -hmm. So there, it, 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 so you're the example that it, it, it actually works. It, it may take time, but it does, it, it does work. Mm -hmm. So there, there is the, the, the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel, which is something that, that, definitely we we need to talk about it's not it is not a uh, uh an automatic death sentence when you are um uh 
when you have substance abuse issues, uh, there is help. And so we'll, we'll just all have to do an even better job at, get, at getting the word out and, and providing for, for, for the resources. Can uh, I just- Ariel, please, please I go ahead. Gonna... Yeah. Thank you for thank you for saying that. And you know, I think that's a really important message. Is there are more than 23 million Americans living in long term recovery, and it's absolutely not a death sentence. And I think that you know, seeing here with all these leaders in healthcare, we've had such a system transformation. In I mean, really every year, I would say the last decade, but even before that, really recognizing substance use disorder as a treatable chronic health condition and and taking a step toward doing that's a huge step in addressing the stigma. And so um, really emphasizing that piece and there are really strong campaigns to also encourage people to talk about it. And I think that that's happening more and more. And I would also encourage folks again on our website or, you know, go on the web. There are so many, the, with COVID, there've been a real proliferation of online support groups, peer support groups. So AA and NA are obviously two of the most common and well-known and have helped a lot of people, but there are also a lot of different groups for people who don't resonate with AA and NA. So I just really want to encourage people, like you said, to go out there and connect and talk with other people that are living joyful, productive, healthy lives in long-term recovery um, and finding that help in so many different ways. There's not one right path. Um, there's not one right provider. There's, it's really individual support and pathways. And I think everyone here is here to help connect people to those pathways and support that. But thank you for, thank you for bringing that up because that's a huge and ending on, or I don't know if we're ending, but really communicating this message of hope. And that's what we get to see too as providers every day is welcoming people and saying, we're so glad you're here. You know, how, we, how can we support that next step? And here are, you'll be surrounded with a lot of people who are living lives in long-term recovery. Just a couple of quick comments, um, and this was brought home to me by a, a long story that I won't share that were shared with me today about somebody with an addiction problem. The first step is the biggest step. It's the longest step, and it's the one that a lot of people aren't willing to take. And the thing that's lacking in our society right now, in our culture right now, is trust. Without trust, people are not willing to take that first big step to seek help. There's such a stigma like we've been talking about. Our society is, is just so much mistrust now. Nobody knows what to believe, for instance. Um, but I just, it was brought home to me by listening to this story today that almost brought me to tears at, at my office uh, about an individual. Uh, and I actually saw a healthcare provider today uh, for something unrelated to an addiction thing. Um, but you know, it, it was all about trust, building a relationship, taking that first step, that big giant step. And then key was establishing trust so that you're willing to move forward through some difficult times. I'm sure Shelley's 10 years have not been all great. There's been some very difficult times in that 10 years. And it takes a lot of courage for her as a mom, for her son to come forward and go through that and walk through that together but that requires trust, it requires a relationship. And so much of our society is lacking and needing and hurting in that area right now. So this is great to see this community come together like this uh, and talk about this. And hopefully this message can get out. Uh, like somebody said to those people, I think Brian said it to those people who really need it. Um, and hope we were reaching out to that group. So thank you. Absolutely. and. <clears throat> The, I get a couple of uh, text messages from, from people who are listening in and um, the, the, the three big um, takeaways for them were like, um, there are resources available. Um, law enforcement is a partner to get people into treatment. It's, they're not, they're not there. They're not, it's not, uh, law enforcement is not there to arrest people or throw people in jail, but they are first responders just as the, the firefighters and the medics. And again, the, the, the resources are available and it's, it's okay to ask for help. So that seemed to be the, the, three, the three big takeaways. And I think that that's actually a, 
that's a, a, pr a pretty good summation. So uh, if any one of you want, would like to add anything uh, to this, otherwise we'll, we'll get, we'll, I'll grab all the, <clears throat> the, the resources in from, from the chat and I will add them to the, the final uh, version, the video version, so that all the, the links are, and phone numbers will be in there. But if anybody would like to have a closing statement, please. Um, I just want to say that this year, you know, has has taught me a lot about trauma informed care. Um, I think I see how my patients throughout the years have like dealt with so much um, every single day. And this year, I feel like we like we as healthcare providers have gone through that and it's been chronic. Um, and so I think it's been a lesson in empathy. Um, and it's been a lesson in resilience. And I think a lot of the statements made today um, is important because one of the biggest principles of resilience is that we need to do it together. We can't do this alone. And so I'm really glad we're having this conversation and um, this discussion tonight. Yeah, and I'll just say that this, um, this issue, the COVID pandemic and everything has reinforced an important lesson that I've learned being part of Nevada County for the last 20 years which is that uh, we're not an island at this hospital. We are part of a community of resources and professionals, and we rely very heavily on all of you. And I hope that you feel the same way towards us. Uh, the hospital should be a life raft in some cases for people. We need, to, we need to take care of folks, take care of our neighbors and friends and family members in some cases, as we've heard, uh, and take care of them with, um, uh, with a non-judgmental approach with kindness and compassion. And I think that's that's what we need to be doing with this particular issue and all issues. This hospital is yours. It's a, you know, it's a community owned asset. We're here to solve whatever problems come. We're here for whatever medical issues come. And this is certainly one of the, the hot ones that we really need to step up and take care of. So with all of your help, that's what we're here to do. Thank you. I just want to say I, I put my um, cell phone number in the chat box. Um, anyone can call, text, um, whatever works for them if they want resources to any um, anything. You can give me a call. Thank you, Shelley. Pascal, this is Steve. From the, um, yep. from the law enforcement side of things, I think what I would want to convey uh, to the community is that we, we live in a very special area in that all the organizations represented here, uh, you know, in this meeting, um, we work very closely together um, on a continual basis. And much of that has to do with how to tackle these problems and the problems of substance abuse and how to reach people. And, and um, in the law enforcement world, you know, sometimes people are hesitant to reach out for help because of the, the criminal aspect of substance abuse. But you know, back when I started many years ago, um, we did not understand, you know, how to deal with substance abuse. And we just called it a crime and threw people in jail. And um, that was not a very effective way to deal with things. And certainly we've evolved as a society. And, and there is so much help available now um, just within our community. And, and, you know, this town hall is, is a testament to that. And so if someone is hesitant to reach out for help um, because of the potential criminal consequences or they're worried about that, you know, even our criminal justice system um, is heavily focused on providing help. And um, even, even you know, if, if a, an individual finds themselves in the criminal justice system after being arrested or something, um, there are processes and, and special situations in the, throughout the court process that, that are focused on getting people help and not so much a punishment model, but uh, you know, that rehabilitation and getting people help. And, and so even in the law enforcement world, um, that's what we're about. Um, you know, the system um, deals harshly with, with the worst offenders. And by that, I mean people who are providing and, and um, peddling the dangerous drugs and, and, and synthetic or uh, the fraudulent, you know, narcotics that are laced with fentanyl and that kind of thing that we're seeing the tragic results of that. That's where the, the criminal justice system still hammers away on, on people that would victimize others like that. But if someone is out there looking for help, there's a lot of resources, even law enforcement would be happy 
to connect you with resources. And we're not looking to just throw people in jail. So I just want that to be said as well. Thank you, Steve. Anyone else? Okay, with that, I would like to thank all of you for uh, making time on this, uh, for this town hall. Uh, I know there is a, a much larger debate going on live right now that is going to probably going to affect, uh, maybe it's going to affect more people, but this is, this is our community. And so these are, these are the people that, that, that can help, that are here to help. So please reach out to them. Uh, it's okay to ask for help. Really, it's, it's okay. And, and, and if you if you want and if you want to stay anonymous uh, for for maybe for the first step etc you can call you can contact us and we will forward your questions anonymously um, that's reporters we we know how to keep things off the record if if that is if that's a concern email us and we will we will try and, and find you the answers but but just know please everybody know that there are uh, there is help out there and this and you too can be safe so and with that again everybody thanks so much for spending a part of your evening with us and this recording will be made available of course it will live for quite a while I believe on YouTube but again thanks everybody thanks to all our panelists uh, to the attendees thank you for your questions everybody and uh, be safe out there bye